I'll always, we'll always take the applause. It's wonderful. Thank you very much, Silvano. And again, thank you, Sat Magazine. And thank you for the organizers. This is the second year of the show. It has grown exponentially in size. And I think we really have a hit. I mean, it's, it's very much uh, it's definitely become a permanent fixture on the annual industry calendar. Now, today, thank you for coming because we have two incredible speakers. On stage with us, we have two people whose involvement in the space and satellite industry, the depth, breadth of knowledge and experience is really quite extraordinary. Both are founders of their own companies. Uh, and both are hands-on in the industry in ways that, well, we'll, we'll discover that when we're chatting. So we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Steve Jervitson, who is a founder and partner at Draper Fisher Jervitson Capital, investor in many space and tech firms, not just in space, but across a broad spectrum. An amazing experience base there. And also we have Sir Martin Sweeting, founder and executive chairman of Surrey Satellite Technologies Limited. One of the founding firms of this very industry wouldn't be in this room without these two gentlemen. And what we're going to do is ask them to each make a couple of remarks, brief presentation, and then we're going to go to questions. If you have questions, please text them. We actually have an, an, an iPad, I think you've seen from the other panels. The address, which I will never remember, is actually in the, uh, is in the, the actual brochure today. You, you, you text small sat to a certain number. I'm mildly dyslexic, so there's no hope in actually asking me for that number. <laughs> but what I do have is a good list of questions, some questions already coming in, and then let's have a conversation. But with that, I'd actually like to please ask Sir Martin, please, if, you, if you'll go ahead and, and give your presentation, that'd be fantastic. Well, thank you very much uh, indeed. It, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's fantastic to see the, the small satellite community growing so, uh, so, uh, to such an extent. Um, I went to the very first uh, of the small sat conferences in, in Logan in Utah, and I forget the date, but it was a long time ago. And, and there were, I think, 35 or 40 people in the room, and it was considered very much a, a sort of hippie venture of, of, of crazy types in uh, thinking about small satellites. And over the course of uh, the decades, we've seen it, it grown dramatically. But perhaps uh, I, I can you know, just point out, actually, small satellites are not new. If you look at the beginnings of the, uh, of the uh, space era, uh, there were many small satellites. But what really changed is that over the last uh, uh, decade, uh, there have been these dramatic uh, changes in their utility. So the early small satellites were physically small, but their utility on the whole was fairly slow. Uh, and what we see now is that a small satellite community provides lower cost, more responsive uh, solutions uh, to many of the existing applications, but it's also stimulating completely new business models. And we've heard quite a bit about that in the first two uh, sessions uh, this morning. The whole key to this uh, revolution, if you like, has been the adoption or, and perhaps the sort of parasitic exploitation of technologies that have been developed out of the enormous investments that have gone into the commercial and uh, leisure markets and adapting those for use in space, uh, the so-called commercial off-the-shelf or COTS devices. But alongside that, as we have to recognize, is the revolution in production techniques, which has meant that actually these devices now are essentially the modern high-rail components because the uh, random failure modes now have uh, uh, almost vanishingly small. Um, and this has completely, you know, I think, quite fundamentally changed the economics of space in both the civil and the, the, the military areas. Now, small satellites come in all shapes and sizes, and this is sort of a graphical representation of Carissa's uh, uh, table this morning. We see on the top right, yeah, the nano satellites, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, it, you know, demonstrated very much by the, the CubeSat uh, uh, evolution, and then micro, mini, uh, and small satellites. And also, just on the left-hand side, is bearing in mind that there are some physically quite large satellites which are still small when you consider them in the class of, say, geostationary communication satellites. And what has happened is that this development uh, of small satellites at relatively low cost has brought space within the range of almost every country on Earth. 
and indeed also, of course, we see it percolating down into businesses, universities and schools. And so space has become very democratized. The big, uh, I think, game change that small satellites have made, if you were to point to one single thing, is in constellations. The low unit cost of the spacecraft means that constellations are now economically practical. They were, of course, practical before and existed before, but on relatively small scales because of the very high unit cost. Now, the very first of these constellations tended to focus on digital store and forward communications before the internet infrastructure existed and in uh, uh, a number of specialized signals uh, monitoring services. Um, and it was really optical, uh, optical Earth observation uh, from small satellites which, which took a long while to mature. And it's only probably in the last 10 years that these have started to be able to produce uh, operational systems. And the constellations, in this case, compared to those that we're looking at to fill the future, fairly small constellations, have been addressing real commercial applications. And of course, these have stimulated a number of new applications, some of which have been talked about this morning, particularly in maritime domain uh, awareness, uh, in uh, smart cities, agriculture, pollution monitoring, machine-to-machine -machine, uh, communications, uh, and, uh, and so forth. And these are the, uh, some of the new areas which we're seeing develop. And of course, many of the applications that, that are coming up in the future, we rather like we saw the applications in the smartphone, today we don't necessarily uh, predict. So if we again look at the evolution of the small satellite market from the last 25 odd years, uh, we've seen in the bottom the yellow uh, shows the, the, the numbers of big sats that were so-called that were launched and then on the top the, uh, the small satellites and again other than a burst of activity in the mid 90s you can see it was fairly stable and quiet until about 2012 and then we started to see as we know in recent years tremendous uh, growth in Leo, EO, uh, comms, uh, and uh, particularly in uh, nano satellites. So if we have a look at the, the number of uh, uh, new systems that are proposed, they cover a wide range of uh, different uh, applications. Um, and we see that uh, there's something like, by my calculation, uh, at least 68 new systems, not satellites, but 68 new systems that are being proposed with a, a predominance, as we see in comms, uh, Earth observation. If we now look at the numbers of satellites, it's very interesting to see that actually of those, something like, th and if all of these were to come to fruition, nearly 13,500 satellites are being discussed in communications and almost exactly one-tenth of that in Earth observation. So we can see the, the dominance of uh, communications in, in these uh, proposed uh, constellations. And why is that? It's because if you have a look at the map of terrestrial digital uh, connectivity, uh, and here you can see yellow 4G, uh, sort of light blue 3G, and then uh, red is 2G. Um, even in the, the uh, you know, apart from the developed areas, there are enormous swathes of the world where there's no connectivity at all. And so that is what is stimulating the, the growth in, uh, in the digital connectivity. So what are the emerging trends? Well, uh, just looking at it, I see that you know, small satellites have exploited the advance in microelectronics. But what they didn't do for many years was to change dramatically the physical structure of the spacecraft. But the new materials and the new robotic processes that we see coming up now mean that we have very different ways of, of uh, spacecraft and satellite uh, manufacture, which will make that we can you know, not only make it much more responsive, hopefully more low cost, and also take quite different approaches. You know, additive and subtractive manufacturing techniques means we can make things that we can't previously made with human hands. And digital manufacturing means that we have a freedom of location and dramatically increase the uh, uh, speed and design and technology cycle. So what we see today, I think, is the digital factory. Um, what we will see very shortly are software-defined satellites. Following on that will be in-orbit assembly of spacecraft where we can make large apertures by assembling a series of small spacecraft together and then eventually in-orbit manufacturer. 
the, the dream, I think, here is, at the moment, if you think about it, we design a spacecraft to survive the rigors of the first 20 minutes of launch, and then it just sits in a more or less microgravity environment for the rest of its life, and so the constraints of the satellite are dictated by this f first 20 minutes. If we can just uh, yeah, launch a, a chunk of metal and a bag of sand and then print the spacecraft in orbit, it means that we can then take a very different approach indeed to, uh, to space manufacture. There's been a lot of discussion, and it's touched on this morning, about orbital debris and space traffic management. These things go sort of hand in hand. Uh, it is a, a serious issue for the whole of the space community, which we have to address. But there is a bit of a, a, a misconception that, it's, you know, that satellites are the major contribution. If we look at the majority of the debris, we see it's from uh, defunct uh, upper stages and satellite breakups. So the satellites themselves are not necessarily the major hazard. What we've got to ensure is that they can, under no circumstances, fragment, because it's the fragmentation of satellites which is key. And this, uh, in, in, uh, in the... Uh, the danger and therefore we have to uh, ensure that we have I think widespread best practice across the community to ensure that particularly with the large constellations that we have really effective mechanisms to avoid uh, a satellite uh, uh, breakup. Um, we also need to look at how we can reduce satellite lifetimes and there are many techniques which are well known to, to try to, to do this. So uh, one of the other areas that is in the modeling of uh, debris and that the current models uh, have not really yet quite caught up with the, the, the uh, notions of having these very large mega constellations. And so there's quite a lot of work to be done. But uh, it's, you need very good eyesight to see the graph, but it'll be available on it, but what it shows is the vast majority of debris is in the black and white bit, and the tiny little colored bits are actually the satellites. So we need to just make sure that we have good uh, uh, best practice on the uh, uh, integrity of spacecraft, and of course we need to address the issues of space traffic control. So we've seen an incredible and in, uh, an unprecedented investment in the, in the industry in the last three years. It's fantastic, and we can see it from the attendance here today. I don't think we've ever built or planned to build so many satellites, let alone small satellites. And we're completely, I think, redefining through these new commercial models what space can offer to, to the users, completely different applications, very different business model, but also a number of, uh, of, of new challenges. And it's sort of interesting, if you look at small satellites and you compare it to the evolution of the mobile phone. Yeah, the first mobile phones were brick size, and then there was this drive to make the, sm the phone smaller and smaller and smaller. And then all of a sudden, people realized, actually, what you wanted was a slightly bigger you know, iPhone 6 Plus or whatever, so you could actually do something more useful to it. And I think there's a bit of a trend when you look at the uh, uh, evolution of uh, the CubeSats. The, the CubeSats have uh, one U, so to speak, very interesting, but have uh, li uh, limited utility, and therefore we see the multiple sizes coming up. Now, about, I think, a couple of years ago, at uh, small satellite conference, uh, together with one of my uh, uh, PhD students from the Air Force Academy, we decided to see if it was possible to come up with a formula that uh, identified the optimum size of a satellite. And we looked at it in terms of its size, its cost, its power, but most importantly, its utility. And uh, it was a fairly rough and ready equation, but when we solved it, the answer, you would be not at all surprised, was uh, equal to you know, the, uh, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. It's 42 kilos. <laughs> now. Yeah, and it wasn't exactly 42, but it sort of rounded up to 42. But it was sort of interesting that satellites of around about that size were around about the area of maximum uh, utility. But we've got to remember, actually, that in the past, we've seen a number of business cases that didn't work out quite so well. Iridium and Globes are, are examples of this, where the finance community got very badly bruised by the, uh, those business cases, and nobody wanted to talk about constellations or, indeed, low-Earth orbiting satellites for about the next 15 years. Now, that you know, wave has passed, and we have new enthusiastic uh, folk uh, ready to invest in these new ideas. And enormous investments are being made, as we've heard this morning, in the small satellite constellations. But all of these investors are expecting significant return on, uh, on their investments. And this is, I think, going to be the real uh, litmus test of, uh, of the small satellite business. Can we actually give the investors the returns that they expect after very substantial capital investments? So I think we're going to expect to see some consolidation. And actually, I think we've started to hear about that with the, the news from Terra Bella and so this morning. 
that this is the beginning of a consolidation uh, to hopefully result in a very robust small satellite uh, community. And as was said in the last uh, 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 talk, we have to solve the small satellite launch capacity and cost because this is constraining the business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Martin. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. And, and Steve, please, Steve Jefferson. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> well, it's a great honor to be here on stage with the legend in the small cat stat community and to see so many people interested in this subject. As, as was noted, it's, it's really rewarding to see the popularity of this uh, program growing over time and, uh, and what we're capable of doing. <clears throat> I'll be sharing the perspective of a portfolio investor in several companies. I realize there's a common theme that I like to invest in autonomous vehicles, be it a SpaceX booster, Dragon capsule, Planet Lab satellite, Tesla car, Zooks, et cetera. They're all autonomous vehicles of different sizes and shapes, but that, that's about the only coherency one could find in the investment portfolio I've pursued. But space is certainly one of the more exciting ones. So I'll b both be speaking um, from what I've learned uh, indirectly as a board member at uh, SpaceX and Planet and being there from the early days and then some of the other things that we see day to day at DFJ because we continue to look for new investments in the sector. Um, I also noted, uh, you were referencing uh, the uh, uh, sort of essential number 42, that on the inter interplanetary transport system, I'm not sure it was widely noted, but there are exactly 42 engines on the boost stage, and I know Elon did that on purpose. There's just no reason that it would be any other number. Right? Okay, so let me share um, this slide because I show it every time I give a talk, but I want to ask how many people have seen something like it, the 120-year version of Moore's Law, sometimes called Ray Kurzweil's version of Moore's Law. Hands up. Okay, I don't know if people are shy or if it's always stuck at around 10 to 20% max. It's like, I've been showing this for over 10 years and I know there's some overlap in the population here, but so in any case, they asked me to show it again because if you updated it, Ray Kurzweil and I have the latest seven years of data points and sure enough, there's been some change, which is very interesting. Just to orient again for people who don't know what this is, it's showing on the vertical axis, the Y axis, a, on a logarithmic scale or an exponential scale, 10 to the 18th orders of magnitude. Um, changes, right, uh, between back in the 1890s to the present day. And every blue dot is a computer, and what we're plotting is how much computational power you can buy for a dollar, right? So constant dollar inflation adjusted, because then it has nothing to do with transistor counts, which no one cares about as a customer. They buy storage or they buy computation, and there's similar curves for both. And what's fascinating is no one knew where they were on the curve. No one knew that they were, you know, on something called Moore's Law before Gordon Moore named it, or actually Carver Mead named it after something Gordon Moore observed, which I believe is a refraction of this longer-term trend. Because, in fact, these techniques Knowledge, this, this curve, this phenomenon, this, this compounding capacity to compute transcends five different substrates, right? Everything from mechanical devices, relay devices that cracked the Nazi Enigma code, if you watched the imitation game movie, a vacuum tube based computer that predicted Eisenhower's win in 56, and so on. A few takeaways. It's exogenous to the economy, right? You can think of it sort of symbolically that. Inventions don't slow down in, in, in uh, slow economic times. They may not be exploited. The companies behind these blue dots may have failed, but the baton keeps handing on forward and forward. And so from a business perspective, I know of nothing else that you can hang your hat on for the next 10 years than this, especially if you're anywhere close to technology business. It's really hard to make a 10-year or 20-year prediction upon any basis other than this. Because if it's held for 120 years, it sort of begs the question, why would it suddenly fall off the rails? And just because Intel says it's going to, don't worry. Intel's long lost the mantle of holding the baton here. It's been NVIDIA for the last seven years. Um, as we've switched to more deep learning and machine learning applications, those sort of massively parallel GPU computer architectures are dominating. And are the vast majority of compute going forward as well. So it's good to know that a straight line, and here's an exponential, slightly upticking is actually a double exponential. Here's what I think it means for the small set community and, and, and investing in general, is that of late, over the last sort of 30 years or so, it's been doubling roughly every year. Which means if you design a satellite using 10-year-old technology, be it that you want to be, you know, rad hard or you want to show, you know, only go with proven technology and you choose architectures from 10 years ago, two to the tenth is a thousand-fold change. In other words, a new entrant using the latest off-the-shelf commercial parts on the computation side would have a thousand x advantage over you without even being smart about how they go about doing it, just using the latest and greatest version of what have you. And in many cases, companies like Planet and others, many of the small set companies we see, as well as the robotics companies and many of the other censored um, systems of the world, are reconstituting the components of a cell phone, the accelerometer, the six-axis IMU, if you will, the low power processor and memory, what might be called the peace dividend of the cell phone wars, to build these other products using those same components. And if you're competing against that with a different set of technologies, it becomes increasingly painful to do so especially to the extent to which software defines the product. 
And I think everything that I've invested in that looks like a physical thing, if you ask the company, if you ask Elon, what is the basis of competition for Tesla or SpaceX, it's on the software side. It's not a fundamental patent. It's not a fundamental architecture of hardware. There are smart mechanical engineering designs, don't get me wrong. But if they could say what going forward over the next 10 years is our basis of competitive advantage, especially on Tesla's side, it's entirely software. And so our investment theme, um, oh, these are the labels in case anyone's wondering like some of the examples of those machines, but I'm gonna go ahead and skip to the next one. What this does is it transforms industries over time. And our, our mission sort of as a venture firm is to figure out what is that next industry that is gonna transform and become a software-centric, information-centric business. Prior to that transition, they're typically crappy, low-gross margin industrial businesses that venture capitalists should not be investing in. So every venture investment in the automotive sector basically failed until Tesla, right? There wasn't an IPO between Henry Ford, starting Ford Motor Company, and Tesla, right? In the US was a deathbed. You could invest, you would lose your money. The same could be said for many of these sectors that are now having a burgeoning of investment interest. Uh, and, are, and we're looking for the next ones, like agriculture and synthetic meat and stuff like that. But most of them fit into the adding of intelligence, almost like the same way the smartphone transformed the telephone as we know it into something that's barely recognizable as its predecessor. That's what's happening in these industries. And just like the iPhone with its predecessors, if you were at Nokia or Ericsson, the competitive response is almost always to just give up, to pack up the bags and go home. And, and I'm not joking, that literally is the competitive response we're seeing when you come in with a thousand X cost advantage, you know, um, which you don't really see in any other industries except in aerospace. Now, and breathtaking accomplishments over the last year, that opening video we saw today did a great job. Bringing the booster back, and many of the other things, like the Dragon capsule landing under propulsive um, systems and also being able to use as an escape system propulsively, you might ask yourself, why did SpaceX have these innovations and why does it matter? Well, we'll get to why they had the innovations. I think it's because they're shooting for a different star on the horizon, colonizing Mars, where you want to reuse the spacecraft to get back home, right? It's a lot easier to reuse the booster in general than it is to build one on Mars if you want to get back home. So this thinking process led him down in the exploration of the design space that just really wasn't economically motivated if all you were trying to do was loft low Earth orbit satellites uh, and geosynchronous satellites into orbit. You just wouldn't take these incredible engineering feats and risks on new product designs if you didn't have a bolder goal. And I think because none of their competitors had Mars as the definitive hell-bent for leather goal of the company, they wouldn't have done the sort of things that, that SpaceX did. Now, some of you know that the U.S. market share, this is a free, you know, the free market, if you will, where you're not beholden to um, a local provider as you might be in a military sector. Um, the U.S. market share went from zero, I mean, from 100% to zero uh, from 1980 through the early 2000s. And the blue recovery you see is largely due to SpaceX and SpaceX's competitors responding with price adjustments, um, but, but it's mostly SpaceX, frankly, and regaining uh, the free market back to say, if you're gonna launch a satellite, who is price competitive? Because you, if you can shop the world, people weren't coming to the United States in the year 2010. I alluded to Mars being the goal. I don't think I'll make that point again other than to say, I mean, I'm you know, rooting for Red Dragon next year and um, I want to remind everyone that photo in the bottom center is what every SpaceX employee sees when they walk through the front door. It reminds them what is the point, Mars and Mars terraformed. Oh, that no. goofy guy was Buzz Aldrin, as some of you probably know. Quick transition to um, one anecdote, and then I'll, um, I'll finish up. Well, this will be a somewhat lengthy one, but I want to give an update on Planet, because visually they're just the most interesting in terms of the data product that they produce, and because it's such a fun story. It started for me in the Black Rock Desert. I've been going for over 12 years launching rockets with my kids, a crazy hobby on the side. And there was this NASA team, the PhoneSat project. Chris was one of the people. Will Marshall, the CEO of Planet, was another, and they were launching these an Android phones on our rockets. They wanted the G Low test them, and they were plattering on about, you know, we well, at NASA, we already tested them in a high vacuum, and we really believe that these little phones right here in our hand have more compute power than any satellite in orbit. Um, pretty amazing statements they were making, and it was sort of a demonstration project, as some of you know, at NASA to sort of shake up thinking around commercial space. And they did eventually fly them, Alexander, Graham, and Bell, the three telephones in space. Um, but here on this mission, there was something different. The guys were thinking about reconstituting those parts around a slightly larger lens, because the image around a cell phone is not so great for space applications. And sure enough, they did. Um, they did a series of testing, um, first in Black Rock Desert, then on balloons, and less NASA. I kept in touch with them over those years. And um, then visited again in a garage here in Silicon Valley. And you know, I'm really excited whenever I run across a true garage startup, like literally in the garage. And this is where Planet started. It wasn't even called Planet. When we first invested, they weren't even incorporated. They, were, they weren't sure if they wanted to be a C Corp or a B Corp because they have a mission, a passion to do humanitarian good for the world and transparency for the planet. And they, uh, 
uh, didn't necessarily want to necessarily even be a C Corp when we first invested. So these are just some of the early day photos and um, online there's a full res version if you want to look at what's on the whiteboard, but it's quite humorous. And so we invested and then led the Series A. And as you know, this is, you heard from Chris this morning, Will Marshall, CEO on the right, really fascinating story. Um, this is their first Dove um, at scale. It's not a model, it's, it's, that is the satellite. And as, as many of you know, in a nutshell, every other company, every, every other earth imaging company is tasked. You have to say eyes on Iraq or eyes on Kuwait. Pick one as you go over. And you have to know in advance, and that usually involves a complicated sales process, an entirely different business model. A planet, in contrast, raster scans the planet by flying over the North and South Pole and will image hopefully, after the February 14th launch, when they put 88 more satellites in orbit um, on a PSLV launch, uh, they'll be imaging the entire Earth every day, every meter of the Earth. And they don't have to change the angle because you're always pointing straight down. It's all kinds of things become a lot simpler. And it's an entirely new sort of hopefully expansion of the market, not just a uh, you know, price reduction in the existing sectors. Um, I'm assuming most people in the room are, are familiar with that. Here are so some examples of some of the most recent images that have come out. Um, you can look down and tell, you know, in the oil tanks with the floating lids what the inventory is in major shipping ports around the world. And using synthetic aperture radar, you can actually look through the clouds and it's recently been shown with algorithms measure that same data, which is of keen interest to some folks. You, of course, when you're imaging the whole Earth every day, part of the whole point is to find things you never would have thought to task, like no one had before an imagery of Fukushima because until Fukushima happened, it wasn't interesting to have tasked a satellite to it. So if you want a humanitarian relief aid to know what, ha what, what bridges were there and then just after, say, a natural disaster, what fell out, you want the before and after. You want to have continuous imaging of the planet. So there's recent, this is all from this month, recent fires, recent um, volcanic explosions, the prior you know, day that wasn't there. You also have time series over time. This is a major refugee camp that uh, formed in uh, Uganda of refugees fl uh, fleeing in from southern Sudan. And just over the course of a few months of last year, to be able to show how that goes, and the same, they have um, various news organizations have found this. is a really interesting way to have transparency of what's going on in various conflict zones around the world. The news, um, maybe we'll save it for Q&A if people want to talk more about this, but obviously one of the new items is that um, after having acquired RapidEye, um, Last year, uh, Planet is in the process of acquiring what used to be called Skybox from Google and also um, will be selling data back in a multi-year contract to Google. It's just a, an arm's length business contract on the sales. So uh, in a sense, Google is handing to Planet the operation of, that op of those assets and Planet fully intends to continue operating um, that, that full constellation and the remaining satellites to come. And that'll be an exciting capability to integrate those two, to have sort of find a change on the planet and then tip and queue, let's say, a higher risk satellite automatically to take images of things that are interesting that may have just changed since yesterday. Again, getting rid of the sales team and all that up front. I think one of the next areas that will be very exciting over the next five to 10 years is all the data layers and, that, and all of the applications that can be built on these data sets. Here are a couple of our DFJ Growth Fund investments in Mapbox and Unity to take the satellite imagery and then map it onto the known texture map of, of, of you know, sort of the height of mountains and buildings to create um, 3D polygon textured environments for gaming or for whatever kind of you know, um, application you might want. You can imagine flight simulators that go through things like this already. And to, you'll, you'll find, of course, much more data analytic things, so like counting every car and every parking lot every day, or you know, tracking all ships on the planet, or monitoring all crop health globally every day. Um, these are going to be pretty amazingly interesting data sets for hedge fund traders to start, but then eventually humanitarian groups and others as well. And again, starting with the February 14th launch, just a couple weeks, we're hoping to have the you know, large enough constellation that, to deliver finally on that full vision. So just stepping back for a second, and, and then I'll wrap up with a couple other tinier examples. Um, you have a lot of disruptive uh, innovation occurring in robotics, autonomous cars, and the space industry, largely for similar reasons. Uh, in this particular case, one of the unique enablers is cheaper access to space. So with Nanoracks and a variety of other companies, you can test things on a one-off, let's say, deployed from station, the way Planet did, to iterate on their hardware design every six weeks, as they did. It, that's nice to have. Then when you want to launch a large constellation, you know, 88 at a go, which will be the largest constellation ever launched on a single rocket, uh, there's plenty of options now that weren't even here just a few years ago. And so SpaceX having, if you will, everyday low prices, you know, kind of like Walmart, online, posted for all to see, really helps with the business case and modeling for a lot of groups, you know, hundreds of groups that have relied on that to get a sense of what launch costs could be in the long run. Simulation, right? One of the secrets to SpaceX's success is this Iron Maiden, the simulation rig, as they call it, um, that lets them know way before the first flight how it's likely to go. That's why the booster, when it came back the first time over the ocean, the first attempt to bring the booster back largely succeeded within its target zone and came to a complete stop hovering over the ocean. Now, seeing is believing, the engineers at SpaceX knew it was a complete success on the first attempt. 
but until you actually bring it back on the boat, no one believes you, right? Or have it standing there on land and, and seeing is believing. So the engineers knew from the get-go version one worked just like the first flight of the Falcon 9 worked. Um, and hopefully that, that, that will continue in the future through increased use of simulation. I mentioned commodity hardware, the dematerialization of the physical thing, much like the iPhone, you expect your next iPhone to look just like the last one. Same with a lot of these satellites over time as well. And of course, serving global markets helps. Um, yeah, I, you all know about OneWeb, because they were just on the last panel, or the, or the opening panel, I believe it was, or the one just before here, actually. And, uh, and SpaceX has an initiative, and then a whole bunch of people are coming out of the woodwork wanting to put up these large constellations of satellites to provide broadband to everyone. I think this is a really huge business opportunity. It will be probably one of the biggest economic boons from the space industry over the next 10 years. In other words, the thing that will make the most economic impact on the most people, bringing 4 billion people online for the first time and becoming part of the global economy is perhaps unprecedented in human history. Um, and so we are applauding as loudly as we can every initiative in this regard to have more net neutral pipes to the, to the home business and, and everywhere in between. Um, just last week I took some photos of the latest OneWeb um, ground terminal and um, model of their satellite, which is very different than it used to be when they were over, over at Google. And, uh, and that's one of the contenders, as you heard, that just raised a bunch of money from SoftBank. And we can talk in Q&A why that's techni technologically different from Teledesic and other predecessors that had some trouble. One, the last example beforehand is jumping out of the business side. I've also been a supporter of B612 over the years, and this is a um, nonprofit. I encourage all of you to check them out. Um, started by Rusty Schweikart of Apollo 9 and Ed Liu, who's flown many times for shuttle and Soyuz. And the idea there is that you can put a satellite in a Venus-like orbit looking out, and for an all-in cost of about $400 million, this is the old product, um, but that's what caught my attention, for $400 million all-in cost for launch, operations, satellite, and everything, you could detect all possible threats to extinguish life on Earth, or even city-size, sort of planet-busting or city-busting kinds of um, uh, uh, asteroids with a forward-looking 50 to 100 year trajectory modeling the end body problem. It's basically become a computational possibility that if you have, you know, three points in a line, you can now predict the orbital dynamics that far out so that you could do this incredible thing and we should do that for less than the cost of a new wing on the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. You could protect all the artifacts was sort of my thought back then. The update in the last few months though that's fascinating is I've been relentlessly fixated on the sensor cost. It's a cryo-cooled IR sensor. Really seems strange that it needed to be so expensive. So even though it was 400 million, big chunk of the cost, almost half the cost of the satellite was the sensor. And sure enough, after a bit more software development, a bit more in putting more computational load into the satellite, Sure enough, a cluster of small sats, as many, as few as eight, um, could do almost as good a job at 100th the cost. And this is some partially published work, um, and they'll be doing more work in this area and doing some actual flight tests as well. But it just is a great example of the small sat revolution. Off the shelf components, moving into the satellite, computational elements or storage of data sets that you otherwise couldn't. In, in this case, it's a synthetic tracking that they put in satellite. And being able to do things that just weren't possible before. Because in, mo in many industries, you don't find 100Xs. You know, entrepreneurs dream of a 10X. They often don't achieve that. Um, they rarely even claim they're going to make a 100X. And you'll see this everywhere in the small set industry, that the march from the mainframe class machines down to the little mobile or laptop-sized computers, if you will, in space, is really what it's all about. Some people had the foresight to know this many years ago. Today, it's blindingly obvious that the future belongs to the small, the nimble, the agile, and the commercial off the shelf. So with that, let me end and uh, say we can go to q and I guess. Thank you very much, Steve. No, no, thank you both. Lots of food for thought there. Um, both of you touched briefly on Terrabella and uh, the Planet Labs acquisition. What do you think this means for the industry, for investors moving forward? <clears throat> well, I'll give you a rest so you can <laughs> take a, a bit of refreshment there. Probably safer if you well, I, I think it goes. I think it just is the first uh, example of exactly what I said at the end of the, the my discussion, short introduction, <clears throat> and that is we are going to see a consolidation. Um, you know, there's absolutely no doubt that you know the value is in the downstream. Uh, the services, uh, content is king. Uh, you know, it, it's only what you can deliver to the customer and what the customer can use. It's actionable knowledge that he wants, you know, irrespective of, of, of what his uh, work sphere is. Um, and so if we're going to uh, look at the, the numbers of constellations that are being proposed, and, and as I say, there was some 60, nearly 70 systems, let alone satellites, 70 systems being proposed, you know, I'm sure <clears throat> that what we're going to see is some sort of consolidation and focus within those. 
And I think this is going to be absolutely critical because I don't think that there is going to be the scope <clears throat> to be able to have all of those systems operating uh, uh, with, on a you know, successful commercial basis uh, you know, in the short term. In the longer term, the market will grow. And as we saw with mobile phones uh, and the infrastructure that grew up around it over the, uh, in the 90s and 2000s, <clears throat> Uh, you know, then once the infrastructure grows, then the market opportunities grow. But I think in the short term, we're going to see some consolidation and, and then some different strands emerging. Any thoughts? Yeah. Well, being on the board of Planet, I should probably just say it's good for the planet. Um, uh, but, uh, but, I, but I'm just tempted to say more than I probably should say. Um, so uh, let, me, let me just opine that I think it's also good for Google, because um, I've witnessed firsthand their spinning out of the broadband um, data initiative. And, and now this, and one may ask the question, well, why is Google doing this? And my, my opinion, again, this is not a Google official point of view by any means, is they are delighted to have someone else own, operate, manage, and provide the data service that then they can use. So having the data contract along with a third party provider is a total win, in my opinion, for Google. There's no reason to vertically integrate unless you thought that you were going to deny the rest of the market access to this data, and that's not what Google's all about. So in the, both the broadband case where not having the Google brand as the internet service provider in China or in certain parts of Europe is probably a good thing. Having a neutral third party is a, is a win for Google as long as it's a net neutral pipe to the home. Similarly with imagery, as long as this imagery can be used by Google, which they of course, um, you, know, uh, you know, made as part of the arrangement. Um, that, I think that's just a win. It doesn't indicate any lack of interest in the, in the data. This is really all that Google cares about and many other businesses. And as many of you know, this is part of a larger initiative to shed uh, the robot businesses that Andy Rubin acquired, you know, um, Boston Dynamics is, they're trying to sell that off. They shut down Titan Aerospace. So they, they, they bulked up with a lot of fun projects to get deep learning engineers that are fungible. And now they're like, well, let's get rid of the fun part and, you know, let's get the business and keep, the, you know, keep a few of the engineers. So it's good for Planet as well. They get good talent. They get an incredible team. They get um, a product line that it, under various stewards has probably received over a billion dollars of invested capital. And Planet intends to fully continue operating. So whatever you thought Skybox was, now Terabella, that will continue those products, those satellites, the, the, the services that you were hoping that they would deliver, should be delivered, hopefully with a bit more of a satellite company's kind of um, expertise, right? Everything from ground stations to the data pipeline, everything that, uh, of course, Planet's been working on. And then the integrated products, as I alluded to, things like Tip and Q, where change detection could be done automatically with deep learning algorithms. Right? Like, for example, if you image the Earth every day, it's easy to just find all housing starts, you know, any new construction of any kind, commercial new construction, people are interested in that. And then maybe take a high res image if it looks like a chemical plant, if that's what you're interested in, or, or whatever, right? So that combination product could be very interesting, have the high res driven by change detection. Um, and discovery, that's something we haven't really had as much of in the satellite imaging world, is find me things like this, as opposed to go take a look at that, right, where you know in advance what you want to look at. Um, I could go on and on, other than I think it's healthy for both companies. Yeah, so I'll stop there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but can I come back on that? Because sure. I'm sort of interested. Because on the one side, we're looking at uh, the exploitation of data. And it looks like Planet is now moving to be more vertically integrated by both having the, the spacecraft segment and the, the, the route to market. So you know, is this a, <coughs> a move back towards vertical integration at Planet? When you say vertical, what were they not well, doing prior? I mean, in terms of uh, uh, playing a role in the, in the space segment, the space access, and also the applications and route to market. Oh, yeah. So, that, well, they've always been selling imagery, and many customers want um, data or analytics. So if you're a financial services company, you don't really want the pretty pictures. You want the car count in the Walmart parking lots, or you want the crop health for your global commodities index. They've always intended to provide that. They do that through partners in some cases. There's third-party integrators who take the data and then do that analysis in various verticals. But to provide, let's say, a basic layer, right, as they have with Open California and other projects to say, hey, developers, here's some of the rudimentary stuff. Like, take, take the, think about the image pipeline. Obviously, you'd like to rectify and, you know, orient all the, you know, the images with each other, and you'd have, like to have easy to search time series. That's basic stuff. And then to run a machine learning harness or a deep learning harness on top of that is, is a very thin and easy to bolt on kind of function that could then open up all kinds of applications for third parties. So I'm not sure it's any change from what they always said they would do and have been doing. They just haven't been able to do it all at the same time. And again, they haven't, I mean, Elon is the master of, of vertical integration. Whenever anything uh, it hits a hiccup, he just builds it. And that's how he got in the rocket business in the first place. Um, was he didn't like the Russian suppliers yanking them around. But I don't know that this is any substantial change from a vertical integration point of view. You might argue there's a horizontal integration going on, if anything. Yeah. 
Well, <clears throat> you're seeing this, this revolution in uh, Earth imaging satellites and constellations. But we've seen constellations in telecoms before. You alluded to it, Simon, as well. The Global Star, the Iridiums. Gosh, back in the mid-90s, it was a whole, whole, whole crowd. What's different this time for communications and small sets? I mean, if I can just put in a couple of comments quickly. I think the big difference is the evolution of the terrestrial network system. And now we're seeing that the, you know, the, the, the so-called you know, space communications uh, area and the terrestrial areas are now merging. And so when we look at the, you know, the very widespread, you know, despite my map that I showed where there's some you know, large areas which are, are not met in, in other areas, you know, the, the evolution of 5G, the evolution of various other networks uh, is bringing communications to be a total system, not a space communication system, not a terrestrial system, but something that's now going to be you know, really just a complete system merging the two together. I Maybe just highlight two things. I think the number one change from, let's say, teledesic or earlier attempts is the phase array antenna. That if it weren't for that, there's just it wouldn't pencil out like it did before. So if you have to track, right, because if you're not in geosynchronous orbit, you're moving, right? And so then if you have a parabolic dish on the ground that's tracking, that's moving parts, it's expense, it's bulk. To use a phase array antenna and to have it get up into the K band and the KU band is an essential enabler. It's sort of it's something we always look for in an investment is like, why now? Why, why couldn't this business have started 10 years ago? And that's a really important checkbox item because the entire cost econ economics of the ground station just blow up in a bad way if you have moving parts. And so these $250 ground stations that are solar cells, phaser antenna, processors, LTE chipset, Wi-Fi, lighting up a village, let's say in Africa, 250 bucks, just throw it on a roof of a, of a school or something, pretty amazing price. So that's number one, and then close behind it, tightly coupled to it is Moore's Law. It just, again, if you're gonna have a digital chain and you know incredible routing of information, perhaps laser comms behind, between satellites, a lot of these things piggyback off the advances of Moore's Law as well. Yeah. So, so why, in your opinions, is, is, this the good, is this a good time for small sets? I mean, it's, you know, it's, we, we keep hearing this waves and waves, but why now? I, 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 th I think it's just, you, know, you get the convergence of different technologies that come and you know, they're, they're periodic sort of step changes, gear changes, if you like, if you go back over the last 25 years. Um, the technology is sort of uh, ratchet each other up and we've now got to a point where the terrestrial technologies the, uh, and including you know, the handset type technologies and the terminal technologies, as well as the spacecraft capabilities and the size and the, uh, uh, although we have a constriction in the launch rate, um, the availability of this and the ability to launch constellations in order to be able to support these things. You know, it's a confluence of all these things that have come together at the right time. If you go back over the last 25 years, you'll see there were spikes when, you know, satellite technology sort of took a, a had a potential, but there wasn't the supporting terrestrial sector and then vice versa. I think it's just all come together. The, the, the synergy of the winds and waves are, are right. Yeah, I think... I think that's exactly right. And you, you could ask a similar question like, why did the iPhone occur when it did? Was there something magical about 2007? Was it multi-touch? Was it, you know, the processors just got fast enough that the whole thing worked at that low power footprint. And I think you're seeing that same thing here in a, in a variety of sectors, from robotics to autonomous driving, that, you know, the software conversion of a formerly hardware-centric industrial product is a really big sea change in many industries. I think we're in the middle of that in the space industry. I do think also there's a collective um, leap of faith that takes place in the investment community, in the fact that many of you are sitting here today, in that we are, I, I think, much more hopeful that the near future is going to be much more like that we'll have cheaper access to space. You know, it's almost a precursor for a good satellite business is access. It's kind of like a precursor of the internet is fiber broadband, you know, to start. Before you had fiber build out, you didn't really have a lot of internet apps that were that compelling in a lot of parts of the world. Similarly here, if you believe that between the major launch providers doing constellations and the small set, many small set launch companies that are all racing to provide dedicated, you know, spares and, and test flights, if you will, uh, that belief amongst investors and entrepreneurs that it'll, it's only going to get better helps fuel a lot of the enthusiasm to, to give it a go. And you both mentioned, well, it's a big focus on commercial at the moment, but there's other apps. I mean, is, is this not just a commercial thing? Is it's, it's more to NGOs and governments? Is that? I mean, you mentioned the, the Ed Lu and Rusty's foundation. You mentioned the early work, uh, Samant, on uh, optics and working with small nations, bringing them in. Are we forgetting that sort of other use of small sats? 
Go ahead. No, not, I don't think so at all. In fact, I think if anything, we see small sats uh, raising the awareness in, in a number of, well, clearly in a number of developing countries as to the, you know, the value of space in helping them manage their resources and their economies. And I think you know, even in the UK, uh, which had had, a, a, on the whole, a, you know, a, a rather desultory view of space until quite recently uh, from, the, from the point of view of government support. Um, a, a study that was carried out about five years ago which looked at the economic uh, impact of space on the UK came up with results which startled the government. The result of that was that government is now looking across all the different departments in order how they can extract the best benefit from and value from space. Uh, and small satellites, I think, have played a role in that because uh, now a number of these uh, government departments look at it and say, well, actually, space need not be quite so terrifyingly expensive as it was perceived to be 20 years ago. You know, it is possible to do these things at budgets which are proportionate to our other demands, of which, of course, there are many very serious demands. And so I think it's uh, stimulating a much greater awareness within government departments, certainly in the UK, and I'm sure that's probably true in other countries, uh, as to how, how we can use space, use small satellites in space, to get a more economic view of, uh, of, uh, of the benefits of space to individual nations. Yeah, I think um, it isn't forgotten. It's opening up in a beautiful way. If you think about Planet, for example, their first customer was in the nonprofit world. And some of their earliest use cases that they evangelized and spoke about were things like catching illegal deforestation as it happens, catching illegal fishing, especially the ones that drag along the bottom. And you can see the trawling from space you know, as it happens, those sorts of things. And when you think about transparency and journalism and not being able to make up stuff about the world, um, it's, I think, going to be for a positive in, in all those areas. And those, they are customers. They're, in fact, paying customers. And in other cases, um, like in the case of Planet, they're going to have a .org for just letting all kinds of nonprofit use of their imagery take place as well. Um, if you, if to say something nice also about um, some competitors, because I don't, I'll, I'll just circle back to the ones I have. I, I happen to know that the founders of OneWeb and also initiatives going on at Facebook and elsewhere to bring broadband via satellite to the world is largely and primarily motivated for the developing world, in particular Africa and places that just don't have access. And, and I know with, with Weiler and a number of the founding and Zuckerberg himself, they really do believe, and I think it's true, that this access to the internet is like a fundamental human right. It's like, it's like having clean water. If you want to have opportunity globally, there's almost nothing better you could do than to light up a you know, connectivity to, oh yes, all the online courses and everything that we take for granted here in the developed world. So I think even in the businesses that will make billions wiring up the planet via satellite, um, it started with a humanitarian goal, as did Planet, started with a humanitarian goal. Well, like, like Geeks Without Frontiers, a great humanitarian organization staffed by satellite guys. It's fantastic. It's making a real change. And so we've changed that. Remote sensing has gone commercial, changed it. Communications, obviously, but what's next commercializing? What's the next wave, you think, going through? In space. In space. Oh, yeah, in space. I never thought I'd get them both quiet. This is great. <laughs> well, I guess if I knew it, I'd probably yeah, I, so I was, keep I was it hoping. very quiet. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I honestly think that you know, if, uh, the, the, the biggest blockage in exploiting space at the moment is definitely the cost of getting there. You know, there's no doubt. And in fact, if we were not to just reduce the cost by 10, 15, 20, or even 30%, which is, of course, extremely welcome, you know, if we could reduce it to 10% or less of what we have now, then we would take a very different approach, both to the, the, how we technically build spacecraft and operate them, but also it would open opportunities for, for business and applications and how, how we use space uh, dramatically. And I think so if, you know, if there's something that's going to really change things, it has to be a, 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 an order of magnitude change in the cost of getting into space. Well, do you see Space Station as a good platform for testing things? The, the current station, ISS. Well, it's good for testing small sats, right? The, I mean, a lot of the companies we see take advantage of that for deployment, and obviously there's other things like the Made in Space initiatives and other things that are using it as a research tool. Um, but not, not directly building off what I was hearing from him in terms of you know, lowering the cost of lift and other 10x 
Um, doing in situ assembly of larger structures up there, that could be pretty interesting once you have a goal outside low Earth orbit, right? So if you want to get to Mars or somewhere like that, you can imagine uh, a different set of economies forming everywhere from here, uh, cis lunar space and up to Mars. Um, I, I might add that I, I think I agree and I hope that SpaceX will in fact do exactly what you're saying and lead that charge, um, whether it's, you know, flying a used booster for the first time this year, hopefully, in the Falcon Heavily flight, Naden flight, hopefully this year, and Red Dragon, and those kind of inspirational moves might start to take us forward. And obviously the ITS, uh, or the BFR, depending on what you like to call it, um, is supposed to get to those kind of price points, you know, these sort of 200K round trip ticket to Mars. I mean, that's got, if you, you know, back into what that really costs per kilogram, pretty remarkably different. So hopefully that'll be the vision you're describing. I think in the near term business wise, there'll be this whole Earth observation layer at the data and analytics. I mean, it's woefully thin right now of what's, there's images and there's traditional markets, meaning people like Monsanto and everyone who have been buying a lot of uh, commercial satellite imagery continue to. But all the new stuff, right, that's just on the cusp of coming, right? And once you have the data that you can apply all these algorithms to, to see what we can find. And, and who knows, I think that's gonna be exciting over the next five years and then, over five to 10 years, I think this broadband data is gonna be the biggest opportunity. And then, sort of growing throughout, but, but not one we've personally invested in um, as a direct investment is uh, tourism and, and of course then eventually colonies, but you know, getting people back into space again in interesting places, whether it's a low cost lunar base, which we, on a little symposium, estimated should cost less than five billion, maybe closer to $2 billion, all in to get an economically self-sustaining lunar base. Kind of, kind of mind boggling, right? That could be a, donation of Larry Page, you know, after a weekend binger, you know, let's just do this, right? <laughs> kind of amazing to think someone's walking around money could set up a permanent lunar colony. Yeah, yeah and, and, and maybe actually part of this is an extension of tourism. Not everybody will be able to travel. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, that's unlikely in the near future. So the development of uh, virtual reality and avatars to be able to participate more closely, more personally in space exploration, I, I think is also gonna be an interesting development in not too distant future. And it's just a similar question, but for both of you, but from different aspects. Um, so Martin, maybe first and then Stephen. So Martin, what do you look for in a customer? And Steve, what do you look for in an investment? Why? That's an interesting one. <laughs> well, I, mean, I think first of all, I mean, when you look at a customer and customers come in all shapes and sizes, so to speak, from, from you know, different applications and different requirements. I mean, the, the thing I think that we do is, to, first of all, is to sit down and talk through with the customer what, it, what is it that's important to them or what is it that they're trying to achieve. Uh, you know, that's the first thing, because if we, if we, if we go in saying, look, we, you know, we've got this and this and this, why don't you have that and that and the other, the chances of us having a mismatch on their expectation and meeting their, uh, uh, their goals is, is very high. So the first thing we do is actually sit down and say, right, what, you know, what is your problem? Or what is it you're trying to achieve? Or what is your idea which you think is making a good new business? And then trying to see how, in our side as a, a satellite manufacturing company, how can we meet their objectives within you know, the, the golden uh, uh, parameters of you know, price, cost, and, and time scale, and of course reliability behind that. But it, yeah, first of all, it, it's sitting down and, and finding out what they want. And of course, once, once you've understood that, of course, you, you do need to do your own due diligence in just making sure that you know, the customer that's coming to you with an idea actually has the wherewithal to, to see it through or has roots to gaining that wherewithal. Did you have much connection with the financiers too at that stage? Is that something you look for? I mean, do you help, do you help sometimes help the customer with financiers and put them in touch with people and... Yes, uh, yes, hold the hand a bit because that way, our, our customers are you know, extremely Catholic in sense, of the small c, in that they come from all manner of, of uh, backgrounds and, uh, and different financial backgrounds as well. And, and sometimes we will sit with them and, and uh, if, if appropriate, help them with introducing them into the, the, how they can finance it. It's probably a minority, to be honest, but that we, we do do that. How about yourself, Steve? What do we look for in an investment? Um, <laughs> Elon Musk jumps to mind. Um, Checkbox. <laughs> um, failing that, it's much more difficult. Um, but, but it is a proxy for, you know, an impassionate entrepreneur who wants to change the world, who has an infectious enthusiasm for their idea, whatever the sector, um, or, and this ability to get you jumping out of your seat the way they will with their employees and partners and customers. Whoa, um, someone's getting a little violent over there. Um, we also look for, lately, I, at least I look for a passion or a purpose-driven business more than just a money-making enterprise. I've 
been slow to learn this lesson in my career, but I look across all of the best companies, both within our portfolio and outside of it, and profit is not the priority. It's a byproduct of the mission. And, and if they orchestrate their business well, and Tesla is a great example, achieving the goal of getting us off of oil in an era of sustainable transport and sustainable energy has to be an economically self-sustaining and profitable endeavor. In other words, you can't suck and lead. You can't be a worse business model than the existing car companies and expect anyone to follow you. You have to be better. But that wasn't, let's just make the most money we can. It's, no, let's follow this mission. And that leads to all kinds of interesting decisions like open sourcing patents, um, doing things that may help other entrants. But it wins the hearts and minds of the engineers, and that ultimately is what it's about. So we look for um, that on the people side. We look for, at least I look for, I, maybe, and I think our whole firm does, but I especially like to always invest in things that are unlike anything I've seen before. Because that's a great proxy for it's actually new and on the cutting edge of technology. But if, but if it's just like something you've seen before, and this keeps me out of a lot of dot-coms, and this keeps me out of a lot of great money-making opportunities ugh, all around me uh, that look like warmed over social networks you know, or another communication platform, I, I try to find something that's different and new. And that at least makes life interesting and engaging and also means there's less competition typically at the place where we're investing. And then, um, usually there's a dynamic duo. It's not, when I mentioned someone like you know, an individual, it's usually a founding pair of people, not, not an individual, that are cognitively diverse. Because then, if they have respect for each other, they'll tend to scale out an organization that has more cognitive diversity in it than a single cult of a CEO and hiring people like themselves. So the healthier companies seem to form from that. Um, and, uh, hmm, I guess it's kind of that, yeah. Well, that's good because it leads on to a couple of questions we've had from the audience. And that is, one is, you, Steve, you have obviously an obvious interest in space and passion for space. How do you convince your partners to also invest? Well, it's easier now. I think it's easier at a lot of venture firms. And then I'll get to your question in a sec. Uh, but today it's easier because you can point to success. And much of the venture community is a flock-like herd mentality of... Uh, oh, SpaceX is making money, so let's invest in rockets. Oh, Planet seems to be doing all well, let's invest in satellites. It, it's just, it's as simple as that. I mean, the, the actual logical linkage between whatever's being invested in and the thing that they think is successful is tenuous at best. Um, kind of like when Netscape went public, you know, let's pile on the internet. Well, luckily, that was generally a good idea um, in that case. <laughs> um, it's weird, but uh, so there's that. So, but in the earlier days, like, you know, 10 years ago, for example, Given my proclivity, you know, launching rockets with my son, collecting Apollo space artifacts for the office, I, you would have thought that I would have found some space investments. And I kept meeting occasionally with them. But prior to SpaceX, it was sort of like this watershed moment. Prior to SpaceX, there wasn't a single pitch that I thought warranted bringing to my partners. So I didn't, in fact, bring anything, not a single thing to the partnership for decision. There was just something about the capital intensity, the lack of a defined customer, the long time frames, you know, who knows? There's uncertainty. Um, and once, again, there's something about everyday low prices and a visible success, like a new entrant can make money, and in fact, the quote, military industrial complex is not so much of an uncrackable edifice, the better product might win. All these themes that SpaceX, um, you know, that stands for um, are really powerful. So it's easier now. But I do remember, and I still say it to this day, uh, an email from one of my partners uh, when proposing SpaceX, uh, you know, way back in the day, um, when they had not yet even had a success, not even a Falcon 1 launch success, uh, his reply back to me is that we should not let our personal passion, passions cloud our investment judgment. And that's true, but I had to fight over past that. And, and say, well, okay, and I had to get some other people at the firm to be as equally vocal that they liked it. And, uh, and it actually led to a better decision that, that instead of it being a, a rollover, like, oh, of course, I had to defend a lot of things. I had to think about things a bit more. And this is, again, one of the values of a diverse team is they make you defend the things you think are obvious. And you sometimes think a little more clearly about an opportunity when forced by someone who's a doubting Thomas. No, very cool. Thank you. And, and so Martin, there's been a question for yourself as well. We talked about the merger and acquisition of Planet and Terabella and everything else. But you yourselves went through a merger or acquisition at SurreySat with Airbus. Yeah, yeah, yes, indeed. And one of the questions is, how did you retain your corporate culture? How did you retain your team when you go into that such a larger entity as Airbus? How did you retain your identity? No, it's a very good question. And, and actually, if you look at the history of small organizations being, and not necessarily just in the space field, um, <clears throat> small companies being con taken over by larger companies, they sort of get loved to death. You know, the, if, if you're not careful, the, you know, the, the, the new mother will come along and say, oh, well, well, we'll help you. And actually, that's really probably about the last thing. You, well, you want help, but you want arm's length help. Uh, and, and just to go back a little bit before that, you know, um, my company, SSTL, was started in, in 1985 with, with four people and 100 quid, $150 or whatever it was in those days. 
Um, and one of the first things I did in order to, to, to try and start the business was go and talk to venture capitalists. But I, I learned very rapidly ven venture, you know, their idea of venture and my idea of venture were not the same in 1985 at least. Um, and so we took the path of growing a company organically and um, uh, without significant investors uh, being backed by initially by the university. But it was interesting to note that Elon actually took a, a shareholding in SSTL for, I think, three years uh, and was a very, you know, made a good contribution to the board at that time before we then come to this, to your point, um, decided we had to change. And up to then, for the first, I suppose, goodness, nearly 20 years, the company had been, uh, the shareholder of the company had been the university. And universities um, don't have much money, uh, if any. Uh, and of course, as we started to take on larger uh, contract, larger contract commitments, the customers said, well, you know, what happens if something goes wrong? Who do I go and, and extract money with menaces from? And uh, universities don't hold cash. They have buildings and they have students and you don't get much money for either of those. Uh, so we decided we had to change. Um, and actually it took nine years to make that process with three sale events, if you like, to look at, look at that. Uh, and on the first uh, two, uh, two occasions, uh, we had a wide range of interest in it from all manner of, uh, of, uh, of financial houses, from trade sales, there was even talk of IPOs and other things. But looking at the nature of the business, which was a manufacturing, a satellite manufacturing business, very, very lumpy, um, not very high return, and uh, quite risky. You know, this is, 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 is a difficult uh, pitch to make to, to, to investors. Um, and so in the end, uh, cutting a long story short, the best uh, offer we got was from, was then uh, uh, EADS, now Airbus. But the key there was that the Airbus management recognized that this process of loving a small company to death would be exactly was what would happen. And so uh, partly from our own sort of uh, requirements that we, we set on the, on the deal, plus support from our government, but also I think a real, realization within Airbus that actually if this was going to succeed as a different type of animal within a big company, it has to operate in an outer orbit. It has to have a degree of independence, uh, uh, of action and process uh, in order to survive. We're going to be the thing. And the, the reason Airbus wanted to, and if I can speak on their behalf, uh, wanted to acquire SSTL was because they wanted us to be the grit in the machine. They wanted us to be disruptive. And so my brief is to be you know, disruptive, to be irritating, uh, to be innovative, uh, and not to lose money. Um, and so those are the sort of the ground rules. And we, we you know, sometimes we collaborate with our, our shareholder on projects and sometimes we compete, Galileo being a very good example. Um, and this is done on a, on a, a sort of proper basis. So I think the real key here was that we is, were very firm about our philosophy, our ethos, uh, how we wanted to work, and the, the, our partner in Airbus recognized that, and since 2009, I think it is, so you know, now over seven years-ish coming up, you know, that has worked extremely well. They have done what, it, you know, what they promised, and we operate independently. We have not been, uh, um, we have not had the benefits of their HR system or their IT system uh, or uh, various other uh, delights. Um, we do uh, yeah, occasionally have to fight back a little bit because the ivy does tend to creep up the wall if you don't watch it, um, to be frank. But uh, it, it's worked very well. And I think to their credit. And, and also, as I know we're wrapping up, and there's, don't forget you can still send more questions. And as we're wrapping up, I think both of you have been traveling a lot recently. So Martin, you were recently out in the United Arab Emirates, I think almost this time last week even. And you were at the Global Space Congress. Any takeaways there for the audience? Anything that you found interesting? Uh, whew, I'm not sure, but I think you know, what was really interesting there, you know, apart from taking away an awful lot of sand, um, the, uh, the thing that was really interesting was the, you know, their, their problem is building capacity in the country. And uh, it's a small population, relatively small. They want to look at a post-hydrocarbon economy. So they want to build capacity. At the moment, the skilled capacity, once it starts, you know, once their universities graduate people, they leave for Europe or for the US. And what they want to do is to keep them. They want to stop that brain drain. And what they did is to take a very imaginative and quite a bold and courageous leap and say, right, we want to have a, we formed a space agency. We want to set a national goal of having a Mars mission. And this is from a country which you know, has yet to build a satellite. 
and I think this is, you know, uh, I say courageous, but it has inspired the younger people in that country. And they can see that there is a long-term goal, a reason for them to stay there, a reason for them to get excited and join and, and try to create a space community in that country. Oh, fantastic, thank you. And, and, and Steve, you're out in Deer Valley at the Morgan Stanley Tech Leaders Summit recently too. So not just space, a bit more than that as well. Any, anything that caught your attention? Any? Well, yeah, that was actually a back-to-back -back weekend of there was an AI and fintech conference, then Morgan Stanley, and then straight to Peter Diamandis' Abundance 360, where I saw, I mean, it's lumping them all together. I saw, you know, the latest OneWeb terminal and, and a really interesting drone flight um, demo by Qualcomm where they have a little one watt processor with the neural network and all the flight controls in it for local control of a fully autonomous flying drone with you know, conflict avoidance and you know, follow me kind of functionality all in, in vehicle as opposed to some network larger computers. So just another reminder, by the way, that there are dedicated silicon architectures that take that Moore's law curve that I showed you at the beginning to the next level if the application is something like machine learning or deep learning. We were investors in Nirvana, which Intel bought, and as well as Movidius, which Intel bought, that do that. And then we have a new one. My newest investment is an analog chip company, of all things, to just radically um, increase the power uh, consumption, improve the power consumption of these neural networks when deployed in things like satellites or Amazon Echo devices, things like that, both image and, and voice kinds of uh, uh, processing engines. So those, those silicon advances, those component advances, we as investors always keep an eye out for, even if they're being deployed in a robot or being deployed in some other application, because there's so many cross-pollination opportunities, so many fungible applications of a good vision system in many different industries, from you know, medical imaging to satellite imaging. And, and in fact, the neural network you build, in many cases, has fundamental lower-level constructs, be it the edge detection, pattern recognizing elements, that if you train it in one set, you can now suddenly jump into a new area with a head start. And so, we're trying to get our head around this, these lateral process learnings that Google takes great advantage of. That's like their whole business strategy is based on this. Um, but where else can we see it within a portfolio of smaller companies that are applying that in all kinds of different industries? And so it was a lot of things like that, um, even in areas outside, of course, this particular area. Yeah, I, mean, I think just to add on India, you know, I think this is a bit of a sleeping giant in the space side because um, they have now got a very firm uh, direction to commercialize and open up their space industry and th uh, the um, applications and so forth. So I, I think we're going to see India emerging as a, a major space player in the not too distant future, alongside others, of course. And, and we're getting close to the end of the session. And I had one final sort of wrapping up closing remarks from you both, uh, but blue sky thinking. What do you think is next, but not just the sort of material industry side, but what would you like to be next? Where would you see us in a couple of years from now? Where would you hope we are? In small sats and in space and in commercialization? I mean, really, what would you want to see? Yeah. Uh, I, I sort of try to look ahead. I don't know whether it's, you know, it's not 10 years. It's not possibly not 20, but it's 30, 40 years. There will be sustained habitation on the moon and Mars. Moon first, I suspect, Mars later. Uh, you know, we now have identified that there are substantial resources of water on the moon, and this fundamentally changes the game. That means you don't have to carry everything there with you. Um, it's now possible to envisage uh, you know, sustained uh, habitation there, um, and that's going to require an international effort. But I think there are real opportunities for the commercial sector, because whilst the, you know, the government agencies perhaps are going to take the lead in, in possibly in manned spaceflight, but we see actually commercial uh, players coming into that as well, there's going to be a lot of infrastructure needed. There's going to be more communications, there's going to be positioning, there's going to be uh, you know, in situ manufacturing and so forth. These are incredible opportunities for the commercial sector. I don't think it's 10 years. I wish it were, but I don't think it is. But somewhere you know, between the 10 and 50 years, it'll happen. Well, interestingly, that's almost exactly the answer I was going to give, um, except with a shorter time frame. Um, but the same goal, the same motivation, the same dream, which is, um, you know, we can become a multiplanetary species. We should do that. On the path to a permanent Mars colony, we could very easily, as, as you point out, and perhaps on a shorter time frame and lower budget, do a test run on the moon for a variety of reasons. There are some arguments and discussions on whether it could be economically self-sustaining for a variety of reasons, you know. You could do a rail gun and put things in low Earth orbit from the moon more easily than launching it from Earth. There's a lot of interesting things, and I think he's exactly right that the discovery of water 
in some of these recent missions, just in the last five to ten years, depending on you know both the Indian and U.S. missions, is a game changer, especially at the poles. There's you know this again. There was there was this retreat we did with folks from all over the space industry and every NASA base, and to get all these different minds together to really pencil out. You know, if we use the latest and greatest of in situ resource utilization and 3D printers on the moon, of maybe inflatable habitats from Bigelow, and of course you know SpaceX launch costs factored in the current model, not older launch costs. Um, it really did start to pencil out. And you have these, even the specific crater lip on the North Pole, was it Piri or was it the South Pole? I forget which one it was, where you have permanent sunrise, permanent sun exposure for solar, you have permanent shield for ice, and perhaps even a Delta T you could mine um, in a Stirling engine. You have just everything, the obvious place to put it. So you don't need prospecting missions. You just like go there and, and, and start with a robotic pre, you know, pre-build. And um, I think that's gonna inspire people like never before. So. We all get very excited about lower cost GPS or Earth imaging, and I do think the world at large is gonna be amazed at the Earth imaging side, and the world at large will be amazed by broadband everywhere. But when you put a colony on the moon or Mars, that gets people's attention, right? Like that is a big, hairy, audacious goal. That is one of those checkbox items in human evolution, kind of like the opposable thumb, right? You just go back, like that was a big moment. And uh, I think it'll inspire a whole new generation of people and kids of all ages. I think of myself as a kid, so kids of all ages to, to dream big again. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. Now, I wonder if there's one other disruptive thing that might come on, which is not particularly associated with the commercial side, but that is, you know, I suspect that sometime in the next 10 years, we might well discover an independent form of life somewhere. And when that happens, I wonder what is going to be the psychological impact on humankind, and also whether it's going to spur space exploration or cause us to retreat from it. And this might have ramifications way back into the commercial sector, which we haven't yet thought about. So I, I, I just think that might be one of the unexpected left field shots that comes in not too distant future. And it might be commercial companies, entrepreneurs heading out there to provide science back to their government customers. Be fantastic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please, thank you, Steve Jervis, and thank you, Sir Martin Sweeting. We're breaking for lunch and be back at 2. Thank you very much to the panel.